Thank you, John, and thank you all of Grenada Forum. You, you folks really represent what I fantasize will happen all across this great land, as a matter of fact, around the world. You've heard a number of speakers in the past that have enlightened you on a variety of subjects. The one tonight, this is very apropos that it be Halloween. This is, this is probably the worst story you've ever heard. I spent a great deal of time trying to um, not want to believe this. But unfortunately, the evidence is that support not only Kathy O'Brien's story, um, and the other evidence is that, uh, that Senator John DeCamp from uh, the Nebraska cover-up, uh, Franklin cover-up as it's known, support what you're going to be hearing tonight. In addition to that, there has been a tremendous uh, amount of information that has surfaced over the past really uh, three years that has come from people who have been on the front lines. Not only therapists, but we have got generals and colonels from all branches of the military and members of intelligence that have provided us with literally tons of documentation, not only supporting Kathy's story, but thousands of others just like her. Kathy O'Brien is not unique. I wish she were, because if she were, I would not be in front of you right tonight because it would mean that this problem went no further. Unfortunately, that is not the case. What has happened to Kathy O'Brien is happening all around the world, and it's happening in daycare centers, it's happening in homes, and not homes of Appalachian uh, uh, people who lack, total edu or lack any education um, or any written language skills, um, who are, have been practicing incest for years. <laughs> this is happening as a result of, of a very coordinated effort that has come out of the intelligence communities, again, from around the world. My, uh, my role in all of this is, is relatively simple, um, but nevertheless complex. I'm going to give you all a background tonight of about uh, a few minutes of MK Ultra information. And um, I would request that you all write some questions down for us. We cannot take verbals. We will take written quests, uh, uh, questions. You don't have to sign them or put your name down there. And we'll attempt to answer as many as possible. Please make the questions relevant to the subject matter because um, I can't, nor can Kathy discuss um, what we may surmise are other victims other than the ones that are the most obvious ones, uh, like Timothy McVeigh. And again, it, it is not our experience. We have no proof. We only have Mr. McVeigh's admissions and some other information that would support it. But that's an example of, of uh, our limits. We prefer to answer any and all questions uh, individually uh, standing up in front of you because there is no such thing as a bad question. We spent about five and a half years on the lecture circuit with law enforcement and mental health. Now that was done to protect us. It was also done to uh, ferret out as much information as we could regarding other survivors who, and um, as well as ferreting out information through law enforcement, or I should say cooperative law enforcement, um, who were like you all, they're free thinkers, and they knew something was going on, but they didn't understand it. I will attempt to give you as much background on myself so that you'll have some understanding of how I was able to do what we've accomplished, Kathy and I. But um, our, our main concern, of course, remains the same focus, and that is to get this information out to the populace of this country, and all the other countries that are affected, and we don't know many that aren't, and also to affect Kathy O'Brien's institutionalized daughter, Kelly, who, by the way, went into an institution when she was eight years old, right after I rescued them, and she remains in that institution or a institutionalized setting to this day. I don't know how many of you all can imagine 
being uh, a child and being raised in a mental institution. But I can assure you, it is not a pretty sight, even though Kelly has not been mistreated as she had been prior to going into the institution. External control of the mind is not something new. It's thousands of years old. It's recorded in caves. It's, re it's recorded the exact formula for trauma-based mind control in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Adolf Hitler was particularly interested in, in mind control, and he assigned his right-hand man, Heinrich Himmler, to do some research, particularly on the families of Northern European multi-generational, sexually abused, psychologically abused, physically abused children. You see, I'm sure each of us understands, those of us that, that, um, that read the Bible and understand it, its, its literal interpretation about the sins of the Father, understand what multi-generational abuse means. In this case, multi-generational abuse, and that begins, by the way, at birth, involves horrendous sexual and psychological and physical abuse that is, that is put on these children by their caregivers. Well, Adolf Hitler knew <coughs> pardon me, that these people who are abused become very, very receptive to external control of their mind. They also develop some incredible abilities like 44 times visual acuity. Now, I know that it doesn't take a rocket scientist, pardon the pun, to figure out how we could use somebody with 44 times the average person's visual acuity. Uh, it's called special forces. Special forces individuals are screened very carefully. Now, back when I was working for the Defense Department, in a project known as MK Ultra, which was the exact um, uh, project that Adolf Hitler assigned Himmler to do for, on multi-generationally abused children, I saw nothing of what Kathy O'Brien is reporting. I saw no abuse. What I saw in the prison systems and in the um, mental institutions were people who had a chance to recover their lives and their mind. I saw things that were very benevolent and I really and truly believe the information that I was seeing would eventually reduce our prison and our, our uh, uh, mental institution populations dramatically because I saw true rehabilitation occur without the use of trauma. Well, I was sworn to secrecy on the things that I witnessed, on the equipment that was developed, and I can assure you that in 1967, all the way up through 1973, when I was involved in this research as a Defense Department subcontractor, the equipment that I saw then was 25 to 30 years ahead of anything known on this planet in the private sector. I don't know if I was even seeing a portion of what was actually available. I don't know if what I was witnessing represented even a small percentage of what was actually occurring. But I was put into that job after months and months and months of psychological examinations because they knew I could keep a secret. I was given a Defense Department clearance. I didn't, I knew about the Heinrich Himmler studies for Adolf Hitler and I knew that Adolf Hitler wanted to develop some very serious people to put in places to control various regions in what he called, and George Bush called, and Nero called, the New World Order. You see, Adolf Hitler was not the first, nor was George Bush, to fantasize about this hideous 
idea of totalitarian government enslaving an entire globe through mind manipulation. Now, mind manipulation comes in a lot of forms. You folks are not, you, you, you folks in this room are not falling into one big, huge trap, and that is information control. And I, again, thank the Grenada Forum for bringing Kathy and I in to impart this message, because we need your support. This book is not distributed through bookstores for the most part. The few bookstores that do handle it, handle it directly with us to guard the integrity of the book so they would go totally uncensored. We published it ourselves the first time. We now have an opportunity before us because many of the people Kathy has mentioned in the book have been indicted for a variety of reasons or are facing indictments or have fled their respective countries or stepped down from power. For one simple reason, corruption, that they could not cover up. Now, the corruption that we're talking about here goes beyond, I hope, most of y'all's limits of experience. It certainly went beyond mine. I had a, I had a household that was, was, this is totally alien to. But what Adolf Hitler began in his adamant research on, he had the largest number of human subjects from which to work. And, and do his horror on. And it was even accepted by most of the people in his country that these prisoners of war were indeed to be subjected to anything that he chose that would better his country. Well, MK Ultra took on the same took on the same uh, scientist because in 1947 when the National Security Act was formed there was a project that was developed called Project Paperclip. There was a few airlines at that time that were cranked up. Capital International Airlines was one of those airlines. I was vice president of Capital Airlines for a period of time. Capital International Airlines. This is very similar to the hat that they wore. By the way, you realize that if we could get these guys to all wear a hat, force them into a uniform, our problems are over. As <laughs> I told Kathy, I said, I don't know how to introduce this information. I said, do we, do, we, do we come out here and say that we're the first and second oldest professions? <laughs> All right, I want to see who laughed. <laughs> well, Kathy O'Brien uh, certainly is a, is a remarkable person, but I can assure you the prognosis for recovery of someone who has been horribly abused before age five, before the brain is fully formed, the recovery um, is... is uh, I should say the uh, the level of recovery is very good. These people can lead normal, productive lives, even though they've experienced, in most cases, a lifetime of horrific abuse. That was the thing that surprised me the most. Now, there are a lot of survivors out there. There are a lot of survivors in various levels of recovery. Kathy is, again, the only one that we know of that is vocal, that has written a book, that's been validated, and we haven't been locked up. Now, uh, I want everybody in, in this room to understand that neither Kathy or I are suicidal. And we, we just came back from Arkansas, and I want to tell you, uh, we, I was in, yeah, I was in, Kathy and I were invited over there to spend four days with the investigators because they had found one chapter of her book they were actually able to validate. I said, well, give it to me in print. And they said, we can't do that. And I said, well, okay. Can I use this recording? <laughs> I was only joking. They patted me down before I went in. Um, but no, these, these people are what I consider friends of yours and mine. Now, uh, if there are any CI operatives in this room, you don't have to hold up your hand. <laughs> but I'll tell you where I'm staying, and I want you to come see me alone. <laughs> Particularly if you're trying to disrupt what we're doing. Because this information that Adolf Hitler was developing 
we developed through Project Paperclip. Project Paperclip was the importation of Nazi and fascist scientists into this country after World War II that saturated our universities, saturated our Fortune 500 corporations, saturated NASA, it built NASA, and it has infiltrated every aspect of society with its filth. Filth <coughs> in child pornography, filth in blood rituals and hideous religious beliefs that involve sac human sacrifice, anything to traumatize the mind. Some of these, I, I, I'm approached by a number of um, avid researchers that say, well, this is Satan behind it. Well, I want to tell you, these are people behind it because I worked for the airline that brought these folks in. I had no idea what I was involved in, but I was recruited by Capital International Airways for the purposes that I could keep my mouth shut, and I, I worked on a need-to-know basis. Most operatives do not know who they're working for. There are over 86,000 of them in this country. Now, you divide that by 50 and see what you come up with. This place is crawling with Big Brother. The KGB never had that many functioning operatives at, in high levels as we do in this country. Um, 1984, George Orwell's book really was a grim prophecy that has come true. Most people are, are saying, we've got to stop this new world order from taking over. It's already here. We're in it. Now, let's understand who the players are and some of their tools. Mind control, whether it be trauma-based mind control to develop a totally robotic human being is one type. Fortunately, it requires a great deal of horrible trauma that somebody's got to put on to these people. And it requires something more than just pushing a button on a console. There is equipment available now that we cannot protect ourselves from. And the amazing part about this equipment is it's available to everyone in this room. I don't quite understand the philosophy about making pain field generators and uh, another device called an MDD-1 which uses a dual coil electromagnetic pulse system which um, affects our cerebral cortex. Stops logical thought. You couldn't balance your checkbook if one of these things were turned on, nor could you think to turn it off. Any more than Kathy O'Brien could have thought to have walked away from her victimization. This is not the beaten wife syndrome. This isn't, has nothing to do with an economic situation. This has something to do with robotic mind control. There are tons and tons of documents. Transformation of America is a book. Our book, an autobiography, Kathy's autobiography. I wrote the first four or five chapters to give you a briefing. But what this book contains is her life, that which we can validate. When this book was printed, we had over 27,000 documents. 27,000 documents fit into five file cabinets. We now have over three tons of paperwork. General Russell Bowen recently, I won't say fled, he didn't like that, I'm sure. General Russell Bowen, who was one of the originators, and he's set up Operation Watchtower, the CIA's drug op. By the way, how many of you believe that the Central Intelligence Agency is the world's largest drug dealer? Can I just see? Okay. So that makes our country the largest drug dealer on the face of the earth. And I resent this. I know now why the intelligence community did not want me for an officer. I know now why um, I was not privy to some of the stuff that I am now unfortunately very privy to. <laughs> because I think I'd have blown the whistle on them. There's a lot of whistleblowers out here now, and you folks are getting to hear them. You've been hearing them for years. This is one of the longest, oldest running groups that I'm aware of. 
I see a lot of familiar faces out there. And I see some people that, if they were in my position, would do exactly the same thing Kathy and I have had to do. I, I'm not into this. I, I was hired because I could keep secrets. <laughs> this is um, against my programming. But I can assure you of this. It would be against God and everything that I am if I didn't get up here and talk and, if, and, and, and present Kathy O'Brien so that she can present her story. Kathy and I are, are really humbled by the number of people that we see that would have done the same thing. And people come up and say, oh man, we, we really appreciate what you're doing. I said, well, thank you. And I appreciate hearing that. I even, hear, I even appreciate people when they say, this is hard to believe. I'm going to look at this book and I'm going to look at these documents. I, I tell them, please, please, please do this. Look in the back of our book and you'll get a thumbnail sketch of some books that you can get that are written by uh, doctors, intelligence officers, and a number of other concerned professionals who present the elements of what Kathy experienced. In 1977, the 95th U.S. Congress had met because a and this is this is good news because I wouldn't I wouldn't have one ounce of credibility up here as far as MK Ultra goes if this didn't come out and I couldn't even tell you then the code name. But in 1977, the 95th U.S. Congress met to address an issue that a Dr. Ewing Cameron, the founder of the American Psychiatric Association, the APA, the lobby group in Washington that, that controls what doctors do for our heads when we run into trouble. APA, I mean, uh, psychiatry is the youngest of all the healing arts, and it is the most primitive of them all because, yes, and I, I don't, I'm sure there's psychiatrists, may, may be psychiatrists in this room after that clapping, I'm sure they won't hold their hands up, but I know there are therapists in here, I've seen two already. These therapists know exactly what I'm talking about because the information that they're provided by their lobby has been carefully screened information on rehabilitating victims of mind control is not only scarce but it's it's required some incredible efforts by some brave individuals who wound up getting sued because they could not violate the civil rights of the individual that they were actually treating the situation with Kathy and I was very different I wasn't a doctor I wasn't a psychiatrist. I had no insurance or practice or license to protect. So I kept Kathy from reading news newspapers. You see, when, when I rescued her on February the 8th, 1988, she didn't know her name, how old she was, or where she'd been. I'd seen this with people involved in espionage. And I immediately thought that Kathy had been a, an information courier even though she was dressed like a prostitute, walked like a prostitute, and talked like somebody that was leading a Christian choir somewhere. And it was such a conflict, I couldn't, I couldn't quite grasp this, this contrast until I was given a, a great deal of information from some people involved in intelligence in this country and abroad. I was fed a treatment modality that ultimately would lead to putting Kathy O'Brien free again for the second time in her life. The first time was when she was born and it stopped right there. Kathy O'Brien had been a victim of the most horrendous abuse system known to man. The type of mind control, again, that Adolf Hitler thought that he could use on certain individuals, putting them in positions of extraordinary power and having invisible strings, the master puppeteer, to their minds and what they said. I don't know if we have politicians like that now or not, because it seems like you don't have to put them under mind control. They'll do anything <laughs> that corrupt members of Congress persuade them to do. 
I've known several cor corrupt congressmen that didn't have to be blackmailed with sex, that didn't have to be enticed with money or drugs. They just simply were corrupt. You see, a sociopath is a very outgoing individual. Uh, leaders. Yeah, leaders. Yeah. Unfortunately, sociopaths have no conscience, no expression of soul. They do not relate to anyone else's pain except it gives them pleasure. MK Ultra was designed and had many, many sub projects for developing the perfect soldier, the perfect espionage agent. Things that I was told that would cover an area of our national security that no soldier and no diplomat could possibly cover. No one told me that we were using them as drug mules and prostitutes. No one told me that we were using them for breeders so that children could be provided sheiks, world leaders. No one told me that we were using them for money laundering operations. When I rescued Kathy and her daughter, the information about this is in the book. It took me a year to put Kathy back together, literally, with a whole lot of help and a whole lot of love. Other therapists don't have that latitude. They can't love their patients. They can't keep them away from telephones. They can't keep them away from newspapers and TVs. And they wind up getting contaminated because they're highly suggestible. They see an ad for fried chicken, they can smell it. Now, I dreamed as an ad man to be able to produce ads like that. I worked real hard just to, just to get somebody to go, nice ad. But nobody ever drooled on any pages that I ever put out. And I used subliminal, I used a form of neurolinguistics. Uh, those of you who do not know about NLP should learn. Tony Robbins is, a, is an advocate of NLP and he teaches. As a matter of fact, he taught George Bush and he taught Bill Clinton. And there's nothing wrong with Tony Robbins. He's, he's not a bad guy. He's a smart businessman. And any smart, smart businessman these days knows the value of neurolinguistics or the language of the unconscious. I always call it the language of the subconscious and I'm getting out, outvoted by all the mental health people. They don't say, that's not right. Unconscious, well, to me, it's the subconscious. But the language of the subconscious provided me the codes, keys, and triggers to unlock all the rest of the doors in Kathy's mind that pertain specifically to her abuse. It gave me information like bank account numbers first. And I found that rather unusual until I found out that most people who had worked around MK Ultra and knew anything about deprogramming, and by the way, there's, it's nothing more, I'm nothing more than a hacker. Instead of hacking a, a hard drive computer, I'm hacking the hard drive up here. This, 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 this job as a hacker provided me some incredible information on bank account numbers. And instead of going down and looting the bank accounts and having to hide for the rest of my natural life in luxury, I took them to the FBI and gave them to them. Not because I knew they were clean or dirty, it's because I didn't want them to kill me over it. I provided everything that's in this book over a period of three and a half years to every state, federal, and local law enforcement agency that was directly involved with this case. And the names of over a thousand agencies and people are in this book. <laughs> I wanted to get this before Congress. I wanted to get it before Congress like happened in the 95th U.S. Congress in 1977 when the wife of a Canadian cabinet member 
had gone in to a mental hospital in Montreal where Dr. Ewing Cameron was practicing. I wonder why they say practicing. <laughs> hmm. And um, she came out as a vegetable. Well, uh, the cabinet member, I, I don't recall his name right now, he got, he was just incensed on trying to find out what had happened to his wife. They put her through horrific electroshock tortures and, and every other conceivable torture, drugs, hypnosis. Unfortunately, many, many others were involved in Dr. Ewan Cameron, the founder of the APA's experiments. Some of those recovered ones, I'm in touch with two of them, and these people are highly functional and uh, most likely will be doing the same thing we're doing, one of them will be, in the very near future. I don't know of any in this country that have recovered to the point where Kathy O'Brien has because no doctor can dedicate 16 to 18 hours a day, day in, day out, seven days a week, and violate every civil right that they've got and get away with it legally. Nor can they have their patients legally go into the safes uh, or safe of their handlers and pull out their diaries. Ooh. By the way, in, in one of the diaries, it's got Bill Clinton's home phone number. It's got um, Dick Thornburg on a Coke deal for $20,000. And the list goes on. This is a small group, gang. We're not... Uh, we're, I suppose, if you consider the, the population of the United States, it's so fractional, these bad guys that are in control of all of us, it's so fractional that we wonder what on earth could they be doing. People wonder, how, how, how does Clinton survive all of, these, all of these attacks against him? How did George Bush survive the attacks against him? Well, he didn't. He, he, he went out of office. But I don't believe anything changed. I believe the guy that he had for his replacement did exactly what he wanted to do, like start out with NAFTA and GATT. We're, as David Icke so eloquently said, a one-party system. There are ways to change that. And there are a number of people that are making some very positive efforts in that direction. But that's their job. My job and Kathy's job is to stand before groups like you, very nervous, because we're not nervous that we're standing in front of you so much as we are. We want to make sure that the information you get will excite you enough to where you'll go out and talk about it, or go out and investigate it and talk about it some more. That's all we want to do. We, we attempt to get our books out by the case, and they get real cheap when you buy a case of them. One box of books, 36 books, $252, if we deliver them. This book is information, it is truth, and it is truth that will set us free. I am absolutely intent on the idea that the information contained in this book will indeed reach the eyes of those who can see. And the information contained on this video that's being produced right now will reach the eyes of those that can hear, hear and see truth so that they will get out and begin to wonder why Sirhan Sirhan had the same psychiatrist, Jolyon West, Lee Harvey Oswald, Timothy McVeigh. Now, boy, I'll tell you, this guy's real popular. He's right down here at UCLA. He was also the first person to call me on my unlisted, unpublished, fake name telephone out in the boonies outside of Anchorage, Alaska after I rescued Kathy and her daughter. And a woman by the name of Margaret Singer, who may be a friend of one or two of y'all out there, but I, I don't miss a chance to bring out the fact that she was the one that sent another character in on us up there. 
I wasn't, I wasn't connected well enough to be told not to do anything on my own. And at the time, I was absolutely out of my mind from hearing this stuff. I was suffering from what is known as post-traumatic stress disorder. I was shell-shocked after hearing what Kathy and Kelly were showing me, and then I was, uh, or telling me, and I was showing this information to members of the intelligence community and members of, of U.S. Customs and other branches of federal law enforcement who validated it for me. Thank you. It's, I apologize to everybody that buys our book and reads it because um, I, I tried to make my portion of it informative enough to where it wouldn't hurt you. And I told Kathy that, that we, she had to include enough detail in the book, such as the antinomical details of her alleged abusers, so that we could get them into court and make them drop their pants. That kind of leads me into the presenter for the second oldest profession, or first oldest profession. I'm get to the second profession. Now, who was first? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. It's, it's, a long de it's a long debate in the intelligence community whether prostitutes or spies came first and second. I, I don't know. Ladies first. Ladies first. Okay. <laughs> That's a good one. At this point, I'd like to present Kathy O'Brien, the person who rescued my spirituality. I uh, wasn't a bad guy, but um, I, uh, I needed that extra push. And I'm, I'm mighty proud to have been with her for over eight years now. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out here tonight to arm yourselves with knowledge about a tool that's being covertly used to usher in what Adolf Hitler and George Bush termed New World Order, and that's mind control. I've enjoyed talking with quite a few of you earlier this evening pertaining to how mind control has affected some of you or some of your loved ones. Mind control is very prevalent in this country and around the world. These criminals that are in control of our country operate on the philosophy that secret knowledge equals power. Many government secrets and personal reputations were staked on the belief that I could not be deprogrammed to remember those things that I was supposed to forget. They were wrong. For as intelligent as these perpetrators are, they're limited in their thinking by their own immorality. They don't have wisdom. They don't think deep. And they never considered the strength of the human spirit. They never considered what would happen when a good man like Mark Phillips gained knowledge of their secrets and used them to restore a mind rather than control one. I know that I'm extremely fortunate to have survived my CIA MK Ultra White House Pentagon level trauma based mind control victimization. Now that I'm in control of my own mind and ultimately my free will, I'm telling. I'm telling everything that I witnessed and saw and heard and photographically recorded behind the scenes of this New World Order effort. By telling their secrets, their power is eroding. I also speak out to give voice to the many, many mind control victims and survivors out there who can't think to speak out and tell what they know and what they've endured. I speak out for the sake of my daughter, Kelly, who's now 16 years old and is a, is a political prisoner in the custody of the state of Tennessee where she's being denied any rehabilitation due to the political affluence of her abusers. She's counting on Mark and I to get this word out. 
on her behalf. For Kelly's sake and for your sake, Mark and I have gone to great lengths to document the facts and the truths that are listed in our book, Transformation of America. Transformation of America is self-published, uncensored, so that you can have the facts that you have a right to know and a need to know. These, these truths have been covered up and kept from all of us for a long time under a blanket of so-called national security. This is the same blanket of national security that has prevented us from obtaining justice despite the extensive evidences and documentation we have. We have over 27,000 documents and evidences. Government insider testimony, medical records, more than enough evidence for any legal procedure in this country, including congressional. But this blanket of national security has stopped us from obtaining justice. It's time for truth to prevail. It's time that these truths were brought to light for the sake of humanity as we know it. I'd like to begin by defining mind control by my experience. I realized that my experience was extreme, that the extensive, total robotic, absolute mind control I endured is more limited than the kind of mind control that is proliferating in society. Mind control has kind of a sliding scale where you've got the total robotic mind control on one side and you've got um, mind control that's proliferating such as in the in occultism in this country or Global Education 2000 where children are losing their freedom of thought and their ability to critically analyze. There's so many different aspects of society that are affected by mind control in varying degrees. It's imperative that this information get out. And as I explained, my victimization is certainly can be applied to all different facets of mind control and mind manipulation. And as Mark and I have heard so many, many times from people who have read the book and heard us speak out, that this is a thread that's tying things together. All of a sudden, this whole new world order is making sense. The erosion of constitutional values, the, the erosion of morality in this country, all of a sudden, it begins to make sense when we learn about mind control. I was born in 1957 in Muskegon, Michigan, to a multi-generational incest-based family. This means my father was sexually abused as a child, my mother was sexually abused as a child, and they were sexually abusing me. My father sexually abused me as far back as I can remember. And I've often heard him state that he began substituting his penis for my mother's nipple while I was still an infant. I tell you this so that you can understand that my sexuality was confused in infancy. It was put into an area of my brain that's much like survival, like eating and drinking would be. I tell you these, these facts so that you can be better armed and understand what's happening in society. And name names, Mark and I name names in our book, Transformation of America, not so that I can say, well, I was in the White House with so-and-so. I mean, I miss the whole glamour part, but this is so you know who the problem is and where these problems lie. The sexual abuse that I was enduring was so horrific that I developed dissociative identity disorder. This used to be termed multiple personality disorder and I'm so glad they've changed it to dissociative identity disorder because it really more aptly describes the compartmentalization that occurs when a person endures trauma that is literally too horrible to comprehend. Even though I couldn't understand that what my father was doing was morally wrong, the pain and the suffocation of his abuse was so extensive that I d developed dissociative identity disorder. It certainly was incomprehensible. There was no place for it in my mind to deal with such horror. Therefore, 
I developed a compartment in my brain, a little area behind amnesic barriers that was actually the neuron pathway shutting down in my brain in order to compartmentalize the memory of the abuse so that the rest of my mind could function normally as though nothing had happened. So if I'd see my father at the dinner table, I didn't remember sexual abuse. But as soon as he unzipped his pants, the part of me, that part in my brain that knew how to deal with that horrific abuse, the neuron pathways actually physically opened up so that that part of my mind could deal with my father again and again and again as needed. I certainly had a lot of experiences within that compartment that, that dealt with my father's abuse but I didn't have a full range of perceptions. I was very, had a very limited perception, a very limited view. Therefore, I'm so glad it's not termed personality anymore. I developed another compartment in my brain to deal with my mother's abuse. Her abuse was primarily psychological. She suffered from dissociative identity disorder herself, and I don't hold her accountable for her actions the way that I do my father, who is fully aware of what he was doing. My mother, in spite of her inability to control herself, destroyed any remnants of self-esteem that I might have developed. And her abuse was so horrific that I developed another compartment in my brain just to deal with my mother. I developed another compartment to deal with the child pornography that my father was subjecting me to. He was earning his living as a worm digger on a sixth grade education and supplemented the family income with child pornography that was being distributed through the local Michigan mafia pornography ring. At that time, there's a criminal faction of our government that was interested in targeting children such as myself for mind control. Because this compartmentalization of memory was something that they deemed ideal for keeping government secrets. After all, if I couldn't think to remember, how could I tell about it? Additionally, people who suffer from dissociative identity disorder develop a photographic memory behind those amnesic barriers because the brain has a defense mechanism that when trauma occurs it photographically records events surrounding trauma and an example of this would be that that many of you who are who are old enough to remember when John F Kennedy was assassinated most people know exactly where they were and what they were doing because this was an event that traumatized the nation and this exemplifies how the mind photographically records events surrounding trauma. So behind these amnesic barriers I had a photographic memory which the government deemed ideal for programming. That way I could deliver messages to and from government leaders or in my case also drug lords who were who were involved in funding the black budget and funding the, the New World Order controls. They're interested in programming me so that I would deliver the messages verbatim. When I delivered messages, I delivered exactly what I was told using the voice inflections of my abusers with no conscious comprehension of what I was even saying was just a tape recorder just parroting out exactly what I'd been told. Another aspect that the government was interested in is that as a dissociative identity disorder person I had no concept of time because I was going from compartment to compartment compartment of my brain with no memory of what had happened before therefore I had no ability to even keep track of time and, and a concept of it was just absolutely impossible and it also makes for if I didn't know what I was doing earlier, I wouldn't know to be tired while I was overdoing something else. Therefore, a person who's been suffering, who suffered from dissociative identity disorder had extensive physical endurance, just superhuman strength and ability to keep going and going and going and going. Dissociative identity disorder persons also develop 44 times visual acuity. Very often that's why you see them wide-eyed with the whites around their eyes because they're actually taking in more of their surroundings than the average person. Forty-four times more detail than the average person sees. That certainly makes them perfect uh, marksmen for 
uh, mercenary operations or for um, intelligence in different areas that the government was interested in, in um, developing mind control. I was a chosen one or a prime candidate for mind control because of the sexual abuse that I had endured. My sexuality had been enhanced, therefore I was used as a sex slave and also delivered messages to and from these government leaders. At that time, because a government, this criminal faction of our government was so interested in dissociative identity disordered persons, they knew that any child that was subject, subjected to child pornography had to have endured trauma so horrible that they had to be suffering from that disorder. Therefore, this criminal faction of our government sanctioned this child pornography ring so that they could identify and target children such as myself for the project. At that time, the politician, local Michigan ma um, politician, mafia politician, <laughs> the politician who was protecting this, mi this um, Michigan mafia pornography ring was a guy named Gerald Ford. <laughs> this is the same Gerald Ford that went on to become the first unelected president of the United States. Gerald Ford, I never perceived his political affluence. I only perceived him as another abuser like my father because Gerald Ford also sexually abused me as a child and sexually abused me right on through my mind control victimization until Mark rescued my daughter Kelly and I in 1988. Gerald Ford is not a pedophile per se. He's what I refer to as trisexual. He'll try anything. <laughs> any age, anybody, anytime, anywhere, just as long as he had control. Because he had a perversion of power in addition to his interest in mind control. Therefore, it was Gerald Ford who came out to our house and explained to my father how to raise me in the project according to government specifications. My father had been caught sending this child pornography through the U.S. mails, and therefore he was approached and told that if he sold me into that project, that he would gain immunity from prosecution. My father remains free from prosecution to date, for so-called reasons of national security. My father thought it was just absolutely wonderful and immediately sold, sold me into the project. He felt like the government condoned child abuse. So did I. I certainly felt like the government did. And my father went on to have five more children to raise in the project, so there were seven of us in all. The rest are still awaiting freedom. Once my father agreed to sell me into the project, I was taken routinely to Mackinac Island, Michigan, which is a political retreat where the Michigan governor's mansion is located. It was a, a bohemian grove of sorts where politicians met and discussed New World Order controls, where they discussed mind control, mind control of the masses, mind control in the school systems, how to use occultism as a trauma base. One of my sexual abusers at that time was the Prime Minister of Canada, Pierre Trudeau. Pierre Trudeau is a professed Jesuit. Now the Jesuits are an intelligence arm of the Catholic Vatican. There's a criminal faction within these Jesuits. I'm certainly not saying all Catholics are bad, nor am I saying all CIA is bad or all politicians. There's good and bad in everything. But nevertheless, Pierre Trudeau represented this criminal faction of the, the Catholic Church, of the Jesuits, who believed in mind control of the masses because they wanted to be the one world church in the new world order. The money that was being brought in through the church was funding new world order controls. And he firmly believed in mind control. Another sexual abuser of mine was then Michigan Senator and later U.S. Congressman Guy Vanderjagt. This is the same Guy Vanderjagt that went, to head, went on to head the Republican National Committee that put George Bush into the office of president. It was at Mackinac Island, Michigan, when I was 13 years old, that I was dedicated 
to the senator who had become my owner in this mind control project. That's U.S. Senator Robert C. Byrd. Senator Byrd is a Democrat from, from West Virginia. And again, as you'll notice as, as I, I reveal any names, that this doesn't have anything to do with party lines. Democrats and Republicans both are involved because it's not about party lines. It's about who's for new, the new world order and who's not. Nevertheless, Senator Byrd had been in office as I've been alive. He's still in office today. He's, had, he's been a head of our Senate Appropriations Committee, which means he held the purse strings of our country. He decided where money would be spent. And I know from, from having witnessed and experienced and saw so much behind the scenes that Senator Byrd was appropriating money and directions that would allow for new world order controls. Not only that, but my father, for having sold me into this project, was, was granted an, a lucrative military contract for making camshafts for military automobiles and, and all. My father became extremely wealthy on his sixth grade education. Senator Byrd, as my owner, would decide where I should go, when, what operations I would be forced to carry out during the Reagan-Bush administration, what places I should be taken specifically for mind control programming. Senator Byrd directed all of my activities. Also around that time, I'd made my first communion in Muskegon St. Francis de Sales Church. Having made my my first communion, I also endured an extra ritual after that that was referred to as the right to remain silent. That's R-I-T-E as in ritual. This involved Congressman Vanderjagt and the head of our church at that time, a Father Don, and they subjected to me to an occult blood ritual. This was so horrific. It was this reversal of the Catholic Mass. It confused my mind because when a person's operating on a subconscious level because they're so traumatized that consciously there's no place for, for what they're enduring, the subconscious mind has no ability to discern and to question and to reason the same way that the conscious mind does. And this reversal of the Catholic Mass into occultism just made it all seem to run together in my mind. It was absolutely horrific. This blood ritual was so horrible that my mind readily accepted the mind manipulation that I endured afterwards, a hypnotic language, the neuro-linguistic programming, mind control programming, that actually changed the way that my brain was functioning. So that, you know that part of my brain that I said would open up to deal with my father's abuse again and again? They changed that so that they decided when, where, and how that particular compartment of my brain would be opened and accessed. And they replaced the triggering mechanism with hypnotic codes, keys, and triggers, hand signals. There's also phone tones that can also open those neuron pathways and give access to the compartmentalized memory as well. But they replaced that at that time. And this was with this right to remain silent. I also had a silence in my head after that because up until that time, I heard, it was just my own voice, but I heard my voice arguing back and forth, back and forth with all these different perceptions and different, from the different compartments in order that I could formulate some kind of a decision about things. I remember before the right to remain silent that I had, I had some free thoughts of my own and I had hoped for a place in the world where people didn't abuse each other. I'd hoped to have ten children that I knew would be at least ten children in this world that weren't abused. I'd hoped for those things, but with the right to remain silent, I lost my capacity, my ability for free will thinking. I lost my ability to even hope anymore. I lost all free will entirely. This right to remain silent silenced this argument that always went on in my head. And instead, all I ever heard from that point on was the voices of my abusers directing me, telling me exactly what it was I was supposed to do. 
that could rob only robotically follow those instructions and carry them out. By the time by the time I was ready for high school, Senator Byrd ordered that I be sent to Muskegon Catholic Central High School. At that time, there was an enormous emergence of information. The Catholics had long since learned the, tr the effects of trauma on the human mind. They'd learned it and kept records of it for, for, for so many years that with such things as the Spanish Inquisition and other aspects where people who didn't follow the belief systems were wiped out. The Crusaders had also recorded a great deal of information pertaining to trauma on the human mind. This information was being merged with the Hitler-Himmler research that the CIA had, had taken and, and had been advancing on. The combination of the merging of the information was very powerful. And Muskegon Catholic Central was a place where this information was being brought together. It was at Catholic Central that the um, the very basis, the very groundwork for Global Education 2000 was being implemented. This is um, Goals 2000, Outcome-Based Education. There's, there's many different names for the, the, the program that's being implemented in our school systems is being forced on our children by the federal government. Global Education 2000 was designed to increase our children's learning capacity while decreasing their ability to critically analyze. That way they would just readily accept whatever they were told without any question and just, just take all the information in. At Catholic Central, I got, I got straight A's. I did really good in school because I was photographically recording everything in, in class. I endured a cult ritual in the school chapel, as did numerous other students in the school. I certainly wasn't the only one. As a matter of fact, that by that time, I really thought the whole world was involved in, in this kind of abuse. By then, my whole environment was saturated with it. This occultism, this, this, this trauma, created the photographic recording of all that I learned in school. Of course, I had no ability to critically analyze it or to creatively use it in any way, but the information was sure in there. It was while I was at Catholic Central that Gerald Ford went into the office of president. I had been conditioned by that time to believe that I had no place to run and no place to hide. This is a a phrase that's, that's used to lock in mind control victims of, of varying levels. That there's no place to run, no place to hide, we're watching you. I certainly felt like I had no place to run and no place to hide. Who would I turn to? I couldn't turn to my parents. I couldn't turn to my church. Couldn't turn to my school. Couldn't turn to the local politicians. And now I couldn't even turn to the President of the United States. I truly felt locked in, which is exactly what they wanted for total control of my mind. Of course, since then, I've learned otherwise. And Mark wisely taught me while I was in the deprogramming process that I did have a place to run. It's right at them. And I had no need to hide. Obviously, they do, by the way. They're covering up all their acts with the national security blanket. After I graduated from high school, Senator Byrd ordered that I be transferred to Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville, Tennessee was heavily involved in um, mind control at that time through the country music industry and above all the, the proliferation of CIA cocaine operations within the country music industry were already in full swing. The political corruption in Tennessee was just all the way to the top. The um, country music industry provided a cover for mind control slaves like myself to be taken around the country to the various places as designated and also to distribute and deliver the large quantities of CIA cocaine that was coming into the country. It was my experience that the CIA's so-called war on drugs is no more than the CIA eliminating their competition as they take over the drug industry worldwide. They took their war on drugs to our street corners and turned our streets into a bloodbath.
country music industry provided the cover for distributing the cocaine, so Senator Byrd wanted me to be within the country music industry. Besides that, he fancied himself an entertainer of sorts, and he fiddled on the Grand Ole Opry from time to time. When I was first sent to Nashville, he was playing on the Opry that night, and he had a musician behind him, a guy named Wayne Cox. Wayne Cox later told me that playing music behind Senator Byrd wasn't the only way that he backed him, but that he backed him politically as well. <clears throat> After the Opry that night, I endured an occult ritual again. Occultism is oftentimes used as a trauma base for mind control. Who can comprehend that kind of a trauma? A blood ritual is absolutely horrible and it's a perfect trauma base for mind control, for the compartmentalization of memory. I witnessed Wayne Cox murder a railroad bum down at Nashville's Union Station. It was abandoned at that time and there were, there were bums around and he shot him right between the eyes and cut off both of his hands, which was Cox's MO for murder. After this blood ritual, this horrible trauma, I was programmed that Wayne Cox would be my first handler in MK Ultra Mind Control. As my handler, Wayne Cox would, would follow Senator Byrd's directions and instructions. And above all, he would be subjecting me to more trauma sufficient to satisfy the numerous compartments Senator Byrd wanted developed in my brain for mind control program programming so that I could carry out various operations during the Reagan-Bush administration. I endured numerous occult rituals after that. Wayne Cox at that time was working directly under the direction of Louisiana Senator J. Bennett Johnston and he took me to his hometown in Chatham, Louisiana. J. Bennett Johnston at that time was heavily involved in mind control operations because he was running an, a band of mercenaries out of Louisiana. At that time this band of mercenaries were um, going in and out of, of South America. There was a lot of arms deals going on. There was, and, and, and most importantly, when the airplanes would fly these guys down to South America, they would come back full of cocaine, which was being distributed on our streets. Wayne Cox was triggering these mercenaries into operation by showing them a severed hand from another one of his victims, which re-traumatized them into um, the occult ritual that they had already endured and accessed a specific compartment of their brain. And he told them that J. Bennett Johnston wanted them to give him a hand and carry out a certain operation. He would then give the instructions and the guys would follow him through. So J. Bennett Johnston was, was heavily involved. At that time, it was 1978, and it was determined that I had endured sufficient trauma to carry out my first trial run operation. An enormous quantity of cocaine had been flown in on one of these operations, and that was to deliver it into the neighboring state of Arkansas. By that time, Bill Clinton's drug operation was in full swing. He was governor of Arkansas, and I delivered this cocaine to a remote airport in Washita Forest, which I've since identified as Mena Airport. I also delivered a little packet of information and a small quantity of cocaine, a personal stash from J. Bennett Johnston to Bill Clinton. I delivered it to Bill Clinton, and he cut out two lines of the coke, and he did inhale. <laughs> that certainly wasn't the only time I saw Bill Clinton using cocaine. My sexual experience with Bill Clinton was extremely limited, in spite of the fact that I was a sex slave. It was my experience that Bill Clinton is bisexual, leaning far more towards a homosexual end. All I've ever seen him involved in was a homosexual activity um, with very limited experience with him myself, whereas my experience was much more uh, prevalent with Hillary Clinton because Hillary is also 
uh, bisexual, leaning more towards a homosexual end, and it was she who accessed my sex programming to fulfill her perversions. Around this same time, J. Bennett Johnston subjected me to some other mind manipulation that involved, instead of an occult theme, an alien theme. Now these, these, these guys who were, who were manipulating my mind and programming me for mind control purposes claimed, and these criminals in control of our country as well, claimed to be gods, demons, and aliens in order that I feel totally helpless, in order that I felt like they were beyond my realm to affect. And it certainly worked at that time. J. Bennett Johnston told me that he was an alien. He told me that he had been part of the Philadelphia experiment and when the ship disappeared, it came back a spaceship. This is in keeping with kind of a, an air water mirror theme that NASA uses quite frequently, a reversal because, this, again, the subconscious mind doesn't have any reasoning capacity. J. Bennett Johnston then showed me, through his, general, his office at General Dynamics, a then top secret stealth. Here was this triangular stealth that wasn't in any of the school books, wasn't being talked about anywhere, wasn't out in, in um, the newspapers or anything else. It was being withheld. It was still a, a top secret. Um, weapon system. But I saw this triangular stealth. It looked like a spaceship to me. I'd never seen anything like that. And everything that J. Bennett Johnson was doing and he was involved in certainly was alien to me. So it was easy for me to accept the idea that what was happening was in fact being perpetrated by aliens. I'm not saying that there's no such thing as aliens. That, that would be foolish of me to even, even say anything like that at all. But what I am saying is that my, it was my experience that these were people claiming to be aliens. If, we, if there's a reality out there pertaining to any alien influence, we need to sort out the government misinformation and disinformation and mind manipulation techniques that they're using. I know for a fact that the plan is to make all of us feel totally helpless, that what's happening is beyond our realm to affect because we've been taken over by aliens, that our independence day is dawning. So beware of that. Understand that those criminals have been keeping information and technology from us under their blanket of national security. They are 25 years ahead of us at least technologically. Can you imagine what they've got now? 25 years ahead? What's happened? What's happened that you're aware of in the last 25 years? Microwave ovens, we've got uh, computerization, and they've had access to all of that to continue their, their own advancements. They're way ahead. So when they say, it's aliens, it's aliens, and they show us some incredible technology, don't, don't fall into the trap of feeling totally helpless that this is beyond our realm to affect. Superstition begins where knowledge leaves off. And they have been keeping knowledge from us for a long time. People have all kinds of belief systems. And I'm sure each and every one of you has various and different belief systems as well. Regardless of what your belief system is, it is imperative that you know that these criminals are people. They are within our realm to affect. They need to be held accountable for their actions and their crimes against humanity. It was 1980 and my daughter Kelly was born. She was born directly into the MK Ultra Mind Control Project on a much higher level, a more sophisticated technological level than I was subjected to. In addition to trauma, she was subjected to harmonic mind control programming on NASA installations literally since birth. 
before her brain even had a chance to form. As soon as Kelly was born, Senator Byrd figured I'd been traumatized enough by that time and ordered that we be transferred back to Nashville, Tennessee to carry out operations during the Reagan administration. By being within the country music industry, we had a second handler. His name was Alex Houston. Al Alex Houston is a ventriloquist, stage hypnotist, in the country music industry. Above all, he carries out criminal covert CIA operations that fund the black budget. And this certainly included bringing in large quantities of cocaine and distributing them through the United States, Canada. He was working at that time and provided a cover for me to be taken throughout the United States, Canada, Mexico, and the Caribbean for these criminal covert operations. As my handler, he took me to various military and NASA installations for mind control programming for specific operations that I was forced to participate in. These operations that I, I won't have time to get, get into tonight are detailed in our book, Transformation of America. And they involve such leaders as the um, president of Mexico at that time, De La Madrid and Vice President Salinas. It was my experience that in, in 1984, there was a, a, there's a CIA trauma base um, near death trauma center that's located in Lampy, Missouri. It's called the Swiss Villa Amphitheater. And they'd bring certain involved country music acts in to bring large quantities of cocaine or, or, and, or bring the cocaine out for distribution. Because Lampy, Missouri is just across the Arkansas line and is very much a part of Bill Clinton's cocaine operation. And it was in full swing at that time. It's also interesting to note that this Lampy, Missouri operation is where the country music industry was more conveniently relocated, you know, right there in Branson, so that it would be closer to Clinton's cocaine operations. Lampy, Missouri was a place where I heard George Bush and Bill Clinton talking. I, where, from, from the point of view I had, they certainly were friends and they didn't recognize any party lines between them. That's something for the, you know, a smoke and mirrors illusion for the public. It's not something they adhere to because they had exactly the same agenda and that was for bringing in this new world order. I heard George Bush talking at that time, he was talking to, to Bill Clinton, and, and I've since photographically recorded it and, and wrote it verbatim in our book, that when the American people became disillusioned with Republicans leading them into the New World Order, that Bill Clinton as a Democrat was going to be put into the office of president. This was decided in 1984. Actually, I'd heard about it even prior to that. but that. As of 1984, they were already discussing it as an absolute fact. It was also discussed in the groundwork for NAFTA that by the time George Bush went into the office of president, that Salinas was going to become president of Mexico and they together would be bringing in the uh, NAFTA, which was the beginning of, of New World Order controls. I was forced to participate in the criminal groundwork for NAFTA, the opening of the Juarez-Mexican border to the free trade, free trade of drugs, free trade of our nation's children. It's absolutely appalling, the criminal roots of NAFTA. Again, this is detailed in, in the book. But it's interesting to note that these political moves had already been decided way back when. And as I deprogrammed, and as, as I was, oh, it, it was really something to me to find out people didn't know about this stuff. I and mean, it was so obvious to me, I, I didn't realize that, that people were unaware and had bought into some kind of smoke and mirrors illusions of what was going on and never thought to look behind the scenes to what was really going on. But I understand good people don't think that way. They don't have criminal minds. They don't think to look for that kind of criminal activity. Just like these guys are limited in their thinking by immorality, good people are, are, are kind of 
blinded from, from that kind of criminal activity until their eyes are open to truth. But this criminal activity that was going on at that time, the people that were involved were following directions from George Bush. I don't purport to know it all. I don't purport to know that George Bush is at the very top of all this, but he is as high up as I knew. It was my experience that Ronald Reagan answered to George Bush, not robotically, not under mind control, but willingly because George Bush was respected for what he knew about bringing in the New World Order. Consider his past. George Bush first began with the United Nations. Then he went on to head our CIA. Then he ran our country through three administrations that I'm aware of, the Reagan administration, his administration, and the Clinton administration, because Reagan and Clinton both answered to him. Mexican President de la Madrid answered to him and knew that Salinas was, was to be coming into power, and Salinas had more influence in Mexico at that time than, than de la Madrid, that, as far as my experience was concerned. Also, Saudi Arabian King Fahd followed orders from George Bush, <coughs> as did the Prime Minister of Canada, Brian Mulroney. In 1983, I heard Ronald Reagan and Brian Mulroney discussing the New World Order. Senator Byrd had acted in the capacity of a, a pimp and prostituted me to Reagan, and I was president at this, this White House cocktail party. Now, Ronald Reagan certainly provided a wonderful smoke and mirrors illusion for all of us. For those of you who don't want to believe that he's involved in this, he told you he's an actor. <laughs> and he did a real good job of it for a long time. That was his role. That's what he was supposed to do. Nevertheless, I, I heard Ronald Reagan telling Brian Mulroney that he believed the only way to world peace was through mind control of the masses. I know from experience there's no peace of mind under mind control. And I wonder at a world peace where people don't have peace of mind. Mind control, the ramifications of mind control are far reaching because I also know that under mind control, there's no free thought. Without free thought, there's no free will. Without God-given free will, there's no soul expression. What kind of a world peace can we have without any free will or any soul expression, without any spirituality? Mind control needs to be exposed in order that people maintain their freedom of thought, in order that people maintain their free will and have that spiritual expression because of spirituality. When people have soul and spirituality, they're going to be acting in a capacity of love anyway. That is where world peace is, not in mind control. <laughs> By 1988, I'd been forced to participate in numerous operations against my will all of which I certainly would never have, never have done. I guess if I had had any part of me that was willing to do anything like that, mind control would not have been necessary. I'm appalled at what I was forced to participate in, but I am relieved that this information is getting out, that people are passing the book Transformation of America hand in hand hand to hand so that hand in hand we can take back our country. This information is information that you have a right to know and a need to know and their controlled medias are not going to suppress truth. Truth prevails. In 1988 Mark rescued my daughter Kelly and I, we couldn't think to escape. I couldn't think to save my daughter any more than I could think to save myself. And all those, those childhood hopes and dreams were certainly 
certainly hadn't, hadn't come to fruition. When Mark rescued Kelly and I, we didn't have any ability to even hope for good people. We didn't know they even existed. We didn't have a capacity to trust anyone. It wasn't within our realm of experience. I couldn't think to reason that Mark was a good guy. But I'd seen him with his animals. And even though I didn't have any ability to consciously reason, and Kelly didn't have any ability to consciously reason things out or to think things out, we had this extra sense developed. We sensed things very strongly. Um, after all, when you consider that we use, what, 10% of our brain, we'd been like blasted into other parts of our brain, and these parts of our brain were real perceptive um, on what's considered, I suppose, psychic levels um, by some definition when we had a sense for things, kind of like the animals did. And we noticed that the animals loved Mark. He had these raccoons that he'd rescued. He had three raccoons and they all loved him and they, they hugged him and they wrapped their arms around his neck and they patted on his face and kissed him. And you know, that was really a neat thing for us to see because we had only seen a man, our, our animals abused. We lived on a farm, we had lived on a farm and we had we had dogs and cats and horses and cows and guineas and chickens and all kinds of animals, all of which Alex Houston tortured or killed to keep us in line to, you know, if we didn't do this, this would happen to our pet. And we loved our animals. Please bear this in mind, that people who abuse children oftentimes abuse animals. If you see someone abusing an animal, keep your eyes open, look further, make sure those kids are safe. I've never seen an exception to this rule. Not that there's not one out there somewhere, but I've never seen an exception to it. So it was, it was very telling to us that these animals loved Mark. Additionally, when he came in and rescued us, I mean, here we were, we were under the gun of the CIA. Everything was very precarious to say the least. I was 30 years old. I was supposed to be killed, as most mind-controlled slaves are at the age of 30. Besides, I was considered too old for sex by that time, so I was supposed to be wiped out. But Mark came in and rescued me from certain death and rescued my daughter from a fate much worse than death and took the time to rescue our animals. He packed up all those cows and horses and guineas and chickens and loaded them up on, on um, these, these different trailers and everything and brought them to safety as well. This had a profound impact on Kelly and I. We certainly developed an ability to trust right there and then. Mark took us to the safety and serenity of Alaska. Since we were safe for the first time in our lives, experiencing love for the first time in our lives, memories of our past began flashing on our mind's screen. As these memories flashed, and I started to remember what had happened to me and to my daughter, particularly during the Reagan Bush administration, I became enraged. I was enraged and what my daughter had been through, the tortures I'd endured, and, and what the plan was for humanity as a whole. I'd have been blinded by that rage, immobilized by that rage, if it weren't for Mark's wisdom in telling me that the best revenge is total recovery. Because through total recovery, by photographically recording all those events, I could expose these people for exactly what they are, for what their plans are, for what I witnessed behind the New World Order be able to get help for my daughter who was in desperate need of help at that particular time. So I began writing out my memories. By writing out my memories, I used a different part of my brain than verbalizing. It bypasses emotion. Bypassing emotion was very necessary for logically making the incomprehensible comprehensible, for understanding and grasping what had happened to us and what could be done with that information. Kelly was not so fortunate. Because of the harmonic programming that she'd endured, remembering the traumas and deprogramming the program did not allow her access to all parts of her brain as it did me. She still needed 
some technological equipment to help her recover. She needed to actually have those neuron pathways vibrated back open with, with harmonic equipment. Therefore, she went into Humana Hospital in Anchorage, Alaska, in an intensive care unit. She suffered horribly at, at that time and responded only to some psychological intervention and not to any conventional medications. Kelly was actually suffering respiratory failure because Mind control has advanced to the point where they know the ins and outs of the, the brain and the mind so well that they know how to program not only the subconscious but to go into the primitive mind, the very area of our mind where um, blinking, breathing, and circulatory, heartbeat, all that is, is, is regulated. And they could go in there and put death programs in place. With my, in my daughter's case, it was respiratory failure, so that in the event that she ever had cause to remember, which they never expected could happen, but in espionage, that, that can happen. We've heard of that, where the brainwash and where the, the, they have the memory accessed. So they wouldn't have, have to take the old cyanide pill anymore like, like they used to, like spies used to. Instead, they would just simply go into respiratory failure, circulatory failure, and no information would be released at all. There was no chance of the information getting out that way. Since my daughter was being raised to be, was genetically and mind controlled, being brought up to be an espionage, she had that program in place and it went into effect. Because of the medical attention that she needed, she was, she became quickly thrust into the illegal and immoral custody of the state of Tennessee, where she remains today. The violations of laws and rights that proliferated in her so-called legal case were extensive. We had one clean district attorney that went in and told the judge that he was violating constitutional rights and, and, and human rights in my daughter's case and cited law after law after law and the judge interrupted him and said, but laws do not apply in this case for reasons of national security. This certainly raises a question. What does national security have to do with a documented, validated, and proven rape and molestation of a child's mind and body? <clears throat> For Kelly's sake, and the sake of so many other mind control survivors out there, we need to lift this veil of national security. We need to repeal the 1947 National Security Act. This is a national security that's threatening the security of our nation when it covers up such crimes against humanity as mind control, when it covers up the CIA's so-called war on drugs, when it covers up the selling out of our country to new world order controls. That's a national security that has nothing to do with the security of our nation. <coughs> this national security has kept information pertaining to mind control for all of you for far too long. We've got to get this information out. We've got to arm others with knowledge on mind control because knowledge is our only defense against mind control. We need to get this information out in detail so that we can all be more effective in our particular areas of taking back our country, and ultimately taking back our world for Kelly's sake, for the sake of all the other mind control survivors and victims that I know are out there. There's many, many of them. And for the sake of humanity as we know it, it is truth that sets us free. Please help us spread the word. Thank you.
Thank you all.